I am Carrie and I work at Spruce Health and I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's event so that I can help guide the discussion and make the best use of everyone's time. Uh, if we jump to the next slide, this is a look at the agenda and I think it aligns with what y'all were expecting by joining this. Um, we're going to cover off quickly on what Spruce is for those of you new to Spruce. We will also cover off on uh, what private practice workshop is. And then we're going to tackle some proven time management tips, tools that maintain a mindful practice, um, ways to scale your practice without working longer hours or having to hire on more folks, um, and when to consider a lifestyle change. And then we're going to open things up to the audience. We've left a bunch of time at the end for questions. So if you, if you have them, be sure to drop them into the Q&A and we will tackle them. Um, and then uh, a quick look at what we've got lined up for, for next month too. Um, so moving ahead, I want to uh, quickly introduce folks to, um, to John. John is a licensed therapist. He's a group practice owner and a writer podcaster. Uh, so excited for the content that John is going to cover off today. And uh, I'm going to let him do a proper intro in a second. But for those of you on the call who are new to Spruce, um, John, if you could just toggle forward one more slide. Um, Oh, you know what? I've reversed the order and no, I'm you're good. You're... There you are. There we go. There we go. Um, I know that we have a lot of customers on the call today, but for those who are new to Spruce, um, just a quick overview. Spruce is a healthcare communication platform and it's designed specifically for medical professionals uh, and for easy HIPAA compliance. It consolidates communication channels, uh, including business phone and fax and text and telemedicine into one unified cloud-based solution. Uh, and the image that you see here is actually a really great visual representation of what Spruce does. And it gives you a firsthand look at the interface, uh, which is nearly identical across devices. Um, so that's a quick what Spruce is for those of you who are not well acquainted. Um, and then let's see, I know we've got a, a slide about John here, and I'm going to let him talk about himself because he is the best person to do that. Um, but just to reinforce that I'll be hanging out in the background, checking Q&A for questions that do come in. I've got Jessica Goulish on with us today, too. She's a Spruce expert, and she can help answer any Spruce questions that come in. And we will save all the time at the end for those questions. So please do feel free to drop them in. With that, I'm going to pass the baton to John Clark. So excited to have you here today. And thank you for leading this discussion. Thanks, Gary. Um, I, I'm excited to be with you all. Um, you know, I've had the chance to partner with Spruce uh, in a couple of different ways, different at different moments in time, including when you all were um, quite early <laughs> and uh, um you were all one of the first sponsors of our show, our podcast, and so I'm grateful for that. And um, I'm a, a longtime Spruce user myself for my group practice here in San Francisco. So um, there's a lot to say about um, just how how reliable and, and handy of a platform it is and uh, just keeps getting better. Um, yeah, my name is John Clark. I'm a licensed therapist, like, like some of you all. Um, uh, I'm on my third practice now. I built my first practice in 2013 out here in San Francisco and learned a lot of things the hard way and found that I had a, a real liking for the business side of things. And so I started teaching it for free in the basement of a public library here in, in, uh, in San Francisco. You know, 20 people in the room taught for free for about two hours. And I thought, man, I think we're onto something and I really love doing this. And it's an extension of my work as a therapist to help therapists help more people. And so that was back in 2013. We've since, you know, uh, helped many uh, thousands of therapists in their practice. We, we help therapists get more clients. We help them design a business around their vision, their purpose in life. Um, we, we really have a lot of great programs for, for covering just about any part of your business, whether you're a solo practitioner looking to grow through your own, you know, podcast, online course, or a group practice owner looking to get help growing as a leader, managing your team, scaling, selling a practice, whatever it might be. Um, uh, I sold my first group practice in North Carolina back in 2019, and then um, created my third practice here in San Francisco, Calm Again Counseling. We're a trauma and EMDR practice here in the city, and uh, we're, we've got six clinicians at the moment. So 
Um, we have a we have a weekly show called the Private Practice Workshop. It's a it's a podcast and it's live on YouTube every week, so you can always hop over there and and check us out. Private Practice Workshop on YouTube. It's a great place to get more help. But um, for now, that's probably enough intro. We're going to talk about maximizing your productivity. I'm going to keep a pretty good idea on time because um, I've been known to get on soapboxes and just go off. And so <laughs> I don't think that's what Carrie wants necessarily, but may maybe a few soapboxes along the way. Can't make any promises. When, when I think about time management, you know, the first place that I went with this was not the obvious place, which is like, you know, setting a timer, starting earlier in the morning, whatever it might be, those, those little kind of tips and tricks. I really want to help therapists think bigger and more strategically about what your business is and how to best leverage your time. Two pieces of that for me are, number one, defining your zone of genius. Okay, so there's just a small handful of things, if you're like most people, that you're really, really good at. You're one of the best in the world at. That's your zone of genius, right? Some people would call it your zone of mastery. Now, if you're a therapist, right, or a practitioner, that zone of genius is probably doing therapy, right? Probably being a clinician in, in the chair with your clients. Now, um, if that is, in fact, your true zone of genius, we want to design your business to where you're spending 80% of your time there and 20% of your time doing the other stuff to run the business, manage employees, contractors, vendors, meeting with your accountant, whatever it might be, but you will get the most out of your business. You'll be the most fulfilled by your business if we can establish your zone of genius and spend more time there. Now, if your zone of genius is, let's say your group practice owner, and it's managing people, leading a team, building systems and processes, building an employee handbook, then design your job, your own job title, and your week to spend 80% of your time there, right? You want to have the most impact on your particular business. And it takes a while to figure out what that is. I know some therapists who are incredible, um, you know, managers and good with details. And they're the type of student that when I was a kid, I would want to be paired up with on a group assignment. <laughs> they're organized. They thrive on details, systems, and processes, right? If you're like me, um, my, my zone of genius is really around helping people. It's around coaching, doing counseling with people, um, creating content, you know, speaking. Um, so I want to do more of those things and really do more of the things that only I can do for the business. There's also a reason why when I call my physician office, it's usually not him answering the phone. And by usually, I mean never. This leads into my next point. The reason he's not answering the phone is that everyone in the business should be doing their highest revenue generating tasks, right? So if you're a therapist and you're capable of generating hundreds of dollars an hour, and you're spending too much time doing 15 to $25 an hour tasks, you're, you're actively losing money in the business. So most of the time when a therapist hires their first virtual assistant, let's say you're a solo practitioner, you hire your first virtual assistant, it's already too late. You're in session, the phone rings, rings to your Spruce app, and uh, um, you've missed that call and you've missed that client, right? Or that client opportunity, they're already on to the next one. They call the next therapist who has someone answering live or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you've lost that business and someone else has gained it. Think about lifetime value of your clients. If someone comes, you know, on average to my practice, five sessions and pays $200 a session, the lifetime value of a, of a, of a client, of a customer is a thousand dollars. And I hesitated because I'm just that bad at math. I didn't want to mess up that math in front of a hundred people right now. <laughs> and, um, so you want to think about that, right? What is that, that business worth to you? Not to mention, what is it worth to you to have the mental and emotional freedom to um, just, you know, operate in your practice and do mostly the, just the things you love and are really good at, right? Again, everyone in the business should be doing their highest revenue generating task. For your intake coordinator, someone answering the phone for the practice, this role is essential. This is a make or break for your whole business, right? Because this person is the salesperson, the gatekeeper to your whole practice. So if that person who could be generating thousands of dollars of new revenue for the business is also swamped in managing your social media and doing your bookkeeping and all those things, you're diluting their ability to, to really help drive your business, right? All right, moving on. 
if you have questions, jot them down on a piece of paper and a note, and we're going to get to them at the end. So um, I'm, I'm aware that this might spark some, some questions, and that's a good thing. So don't want to move too fast or move too slow. So hopefully the pace is okay. Um, and I'll take a mindful deep breath on that note. Tools to maintain a mindful practice. Um, I, I've, I've helped a lot of therapists start their business. And, you know, a, a buddy of mine who's in my office suite, he's gotten away with a couple years into it, not having a phone system, not having the HR, you know, relying on free tools or a free phone system like Google Voice, which by the way, is not HIPAA compliant by a long shot. And it's not professional. It doesn't represent your brand well. He doesn't have any HR, right? So when it comes to appointment reminders, he sends those you know, manually every single week. That's not the best use of his time, right? He's not doing, that's not a high revenue generating task. So you want to think about having the right tool for the right job from day one. There's only a handful of tools you really need to start a practice, right? Um, and your EHR and, uh, um, and something like Spruce, you know, communication system like Spruce is really a, a majority of what you would need in terms of tools to, to run the practice. Um, I used to do construction for a nonprofit and we would talk about using the right tool for the right job. So if I'm cutting a piece of trim for a window, I could kind of get away with, you know, using a circular saw for it. Um, but if I really want to do it the right way, I've got to have the right tool for the right job, right? I want a, a tool that's designed for that job. When you do that, you're going to get the best result. You're going to get something that's been designed for that purpose. Do everything like it's the last time you'll ever do it, right? So if I want to have some crazy spreadsheet instead of an EHR because I'm trying to cut corners or whatever it is, um, I'm just going to have to create more work for myself later when I get an EHR and then building that out, right? Build it right the first time and build it to scale. The litmus test for all of this, the stress test is, I wanna have tools and systems and processes that could scale from one clinician to 100. So when we hired our first clinician in our practice, we built an internal team site that has onboarding. It has videos on how to use the different tools we have, um, what to do to, if you're locked out of the office, things like that. It was a lot of time up front to build that you know, for one clinician, but I've told my team from day one, build it, build a, something like that that would work for a hundred clinicians. And that's exactly what we've done. Now that we have six, those systems, you know, get stress tested and they work. Same thing for something like Spruce, right? Have Spruce from day one. And uh, instead of trying to piecemeal a bunch of tools together or whatever it is, all your clinicians have a Google voice number, et cetera, um, right tool for the right job early on and have a, tools that, a tool that can scale with you. Right. You add a new clinician, you add them, you know, to your Spruce account and they get their own line. They can communicate with their clients. They can communicate internally with you. Right. And your team. Um, yeah, I feel, feel quite strongly about this. There's no reason to do the same job twice. Right. right? Um, make sure you have clear open lines of communication again with your clients or patients, whatever you might call them. And those same clear and open lines of communication with your team, you want to make it easy to, you know, facilitate the work with one another. We're living in 2022. There's just so many great tools and pieces of technology that can, that can help you do this. And, and really this all ties back into leveraging your time, right? Leveraging your time well. All right, moving on. So, um, yeah, continuing to move forward, we're going to talk a little bit about how to scale your practice um, without hiring clinicians or working more, more hours, right? The, the reality is in our type of business, we are trading time for money and there's a, there's a bit of a glass ceiling on that in terms of how far we can go, how big we can grow our business, right? That being said, you know, hiring clinicians is one way to do it. You're hiring more people that can deliver that service, that can trade their time for money, and you hope to earn a profit on that service that's been delivered. However, if you don't want to go that route, um, I, I always recommend looking at all the options before you decide, before you just say, yeah, I'm going to open a group practice just because. I think it's a thing to do. I want to make passive income. 
those are the wrong reasons to do it. You're, you're just replacing one job with another. I want you to think about the value ladder for your practice, okay? So value ladder is something, you know, that um, I learned through just kind of online business and thinking about for this business, private practice workshop, what are the different steps people can take within the business? What are the offerings that we have and how do we make sure those are kind of building on one another? This is a value ladder example that I see for a private practice, right? Someone providing a, a service, a fee for service. The first is one, one to one, right? This is the most obvious place to start. Um, we're, we're trading time for money. This is the least scalable option, right? So that's one to one. The next is an intensive model. So let's say you're charging 200 an hour, but you can only see six clients in a day or whatever it is. You move into an intensive model. You're doing EMDR intensives or Gottman therapy or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, you know, you're working two weekends a month, but you're kind of batching that time together. Um, perhaps you're charging more for that intensive or you're charging a package, you know, where you're making five grand a day twice a month. Before you start going through objections in your head, just humor me and let's imagine that that's possible, right? Um, before we find reasons why not work. Um, this is also the point in the workshop where I start to get really overheated. So I'm gonna be fanning myself with a piece of paper. <laughs> it's heating up in San Francisco and this is life with no AC out here. So yeah, I'm, I'm a passionate individual, so. John, I have to interrupt and tell you the same thing happens to me. So don't worry about the over. Good, good. I often have to take sweaters off. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's a thing that happens. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so moving moving on from intensives, the next step on the value ladder, the next rung is one to a few right groups. So all of a sudden your rate was two hundred an hour, but now you've got eight people in a group. It's one hour a week and you're charging a hundred bucks per person per group. You've just, you've just taken your hourly rate from 200 to 800. Again, I'm hoping I did that math, right? That's a pretty good deal for me, right? $800 an hour versus 200. You're scaling, you're scaling your business in a way that still doesn't involve hiring more people or working more. You're just working differently. The last step and the one that's perhaps the hardest, right, is um, one to many in the form of a course or a membership site or what they call a durable product, right? A durable product is just something that you could sell one time or you could sell it a million times. And uh, the, the sale of that product can hold up, right? So if I'm selling an online course, and it's $1,000, people just pay through PayPal, they get my course. Um, and it's not involving more of my time, or maybe I do a monthly Q and A, but it could be 100 people, it could be 500 people, right, or whatever it is. Um, this is just an example of a durable product. So, thinking about again these different rungs on your value ladder, and and if you want to, you know, go along with this, just think about sketching them out right now and create an actual letter steps. You know, I'll do like steps and like a staircase. What is my value ladder? Maybe it's just two things on there right now. Maybe you have one on ones. Um, which is where most people start. And then maybe you want to add intensives by the end of the year or add group therapy. Yeah. Um, how else do you scale your practice again without hiring or working more? Here's an exercise for you. Uh, a friend of mine uh, calls this the delegation roadmap. This is the exercise. You write down every single thing you do in a week. The easiest way to do this is to look at last week or look at this week or next week. And every time you do something, put it in your calendar. Like if for 20 minutes, you wrote clinical notes or 20 minutes, you corresponded with clients or rescheduled them or created super bills, write all that down in your calendar and document that time. Then you go one by one and you rate each task in terms of the energy that it kind of took from you and how you felt while doing it, positive, neutral, or negative. Then you ask yourself with these tasks, right? The ones that are neutral or negative, could I hire someone to do these tasks for me um, that could do them 80% as well as I could with some degree of training? This is how we avoid superhero syndrome. So superhero syndrome is no one can do what I do as well as I do. Therefore, I have to shoulder every single part of my business all the time. This is therapists in particular struggle with this big time, right? Doing every single part of your business and tr not trusting other people to help you or take off some piece of this. 
Again, an easy one is get the phones off of your plate and onto the plate of, of a VA, a virtual assistant, an intake coordinator, someone like that, that could be very part-time. They can be booking you business. They can probably sell you better than you can sell you. Because if I get on the phone with someone like that and they can sell the therapist, it's already you know, looking and feeling more professional when you, know, you have this, this front of house person, this, this um, person representing your brand. So then you take these tasks, right? And you essentially decide to delegate, outsource, automate, or eliminate. Um, anything that can be aut automated with technology is to me kind of a no brainer, right? Um, that's the first place I wanna start and think about, um, can, I, can I use technology to eliminate this task, right? So something like people booking initial consults, if they're emailing me back and forth to book that, that's a major waste of my time and theirs. And you probably lose business that way. It's too clunky and antiquated. Get a software, get a scheduling software, whether it's your EHR or something else where they can schedule that free consult. So look for things like that that you can automate. Same thing with super bills, right? If you or someone else is manually creating super bills every single month, what a major waste of your time that, by the way, you're not getting paid for. Automate that with your EHR, whatever it might be. Um, delegate, outsource, automate, or eliminate. A lot of things you just don't need to do. There's a lot of things um, that... that are probably useless, you know, in your business that you're already doing. So you want to think about those things and just have the courage to, to eliminate them altogether and make a more lean business. All right. I think I skipped one. Yes, I did. Last slide here um, before I have a heat stroke and then I'll have a heat stroke during the Q and a um, when to consider a lifestyle change. And this is probably my favorite question, I think, because um, a big part of my brand and how I kind of help therapists is starting with a vision for your life and business. You also have to take action on it, right? Vision without implementation is hallucination. Whoever said that, smart, someone smarter than me. Um, but you want to think about a vision for your business and life. Otherwise, you will just be operating randomly, making decisions randomly, and you're going to end up at a really random place, right? Take time right now. Do yourself a favor of answering these questions right now instead of later. You can even take a screenshot of this if you want. This is where you let yourself daydream, right? And, and, and again, going back to that intensive idea, what if I could do two, work two days a month, charging $5,000 a day, making 10 grand a month? Why not? Why is that not possible? I know therapists that are literally doing it, right? Why is it not possible? Let yourself daydream the same way that a kid would daydream, right? You know, the kid is like, I want to be a, um, you know, I don't know, a paleontologist helicopter pilot. Why not? Like, let's go with that. You know, that's what my, my little nephew would do. Just dream, let yourself daydream, because that's a lot of times how you can connect with what you actually want in life. These are the questions, right? Who do you want to serve? This might be who you're already serving. This might be a niche or an area that you're not in yet. Um, another way of looking at it might be, you know, if you're a group practice owner, maybe part of it is you're, you're serving your clinicians. Otherwise, who's the audience you're serving? Who are the consumers or the niche that you're serving? Angry teenage boys, female veterans with PTSD. What exact schedule do you want to work? So what's the perfect schedule for you in a given week and in a given year? You want to take off four weeks a year, go to Italy every summer. Um, do that and create that as part of your vision. If you want to be off work every day by 3 p.m. to pick up your kids, this is the time to put that in there and start designing your business around it. How do you want to feel, right? So think about when you've had like a pretty perfect day at work. How did you feel? What did you do differently? If you're looking at your schedule for tomorrow and you're thinking, wow, I can't wait for tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. What clients are on your books for tomorrow? Who are they? What kind of people are they? Why is it, you know, why are they great clients for you? When do you feel most helpful, most useful, and in that zone of genius, which again, we'll talk about. How much money do you want or need to make? And these are two different questions. Need is absolute necessity. So you sit down with your partner, whomever, and say, we've got, this is our baseline expenses for our personal life. We need to make three or four times this per month. Gross. Um, let's engineer my business around that number. Otherwise, you're just going to say, I want more, 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 more. Six figures. Okay, what does that mean? Every therapist tells me they want to make six figures. What does that mean? Multiple six figures. What does that mean? Why? How is that going to change your life? Your goals need to have layers like an onion. So you need to really sell me on it. And if you come to me and say, I want to make $500,000 a year, 
that's fine. I'm agnostic to your goals, right? It's about you and your values in your life. You need to have many layers. Why? I want to make $500,000 a year so that I can do X, Y, and Z with it and pay for these things and invest this much and buy this much real estate and retire at this age or give back, start a nonprofit with this amount of money. Yeah, your goals have to have depth. If you have superficial goals, shallow goals, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to keep you going in this for a long haul, right? And the risk of burnout has never been higher. A lot of us are right in the middle of burnout right now and have been for two and a half years now, right? More pressure than ever on therapists, more fatigue, right? More burnout, more therapists just zoning out and quitting altogether. And by the way, we don't have enough therapists graduating to meet supply and demand as more people are getting therapy and wanting therapy. We're on the brink of a major supply and demand issue. So that would be a soapbox for me to get on, but that's not why Carrie brought me here today. <laughs> the last one is what is your unique zone of genius and how can you spend 80% of your time there again? So going back to what do I love? What am I extremely good at? Where are my gifts? And how do I spend more time using those gifts, right? Um, that was almost 30 minutes, pretty darn close. Um, I'm going to take a pause here, take a sip of water and um, while we wait for some questions to be pulled up. So um, yeah, hopefully we've got some good questions coming in. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Take that pause for sure. Uh, I know what it's like to talk for 30 minutes straight and it is um, both exhausting and overheating. And uh, yeah, for all you folks who are not in the Bay Area, it is a constant conundrum. I am um, I can see the sunshine out there. I'm wearing sweaters, but then all of a sudden you start getting real hot, real fast, and we don't have AC. So such is the life in San Francisco. Um, but I do see some good questions that have come in and I'm going to have Jessica uh, join me because I know she's been in the, the background this whole time, helping out with fielding them. Hi, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everybody on here. Um, you probably see my name maybe from an email if you joined Spruce recently. Um, and just wanted to say we're uh, some questions that we already dismissed. We are recording this. Um, you will be sent this. You'll also be sent the, a PDF of the slide deck so you can review at your leisure. And um, so now we'll just go over some questions that came up and also just hover over our, our video right now on the slide deck and you'll see a thing that says Q&A and you tap that and that's where you can put uh, the questions in. Uh, we don't have the chat. Because uh, the questions are a little bit easier to come in through Q and A, because we can make sure to get all of them. Um, and if you think of anything later, you can always email us at support at sprucehealth.com or sales at sprucehealth.com, which we'll get to at the end. Um, all right. So a couple questions, uh, John. We had quite a few questions about one topic, so I thought we'd start with that. Sure. Um, so, and also, I would love. Uh, so you talked about intensives. And someone said, um, how do we recruit clients for intensives? Yeah. I thought it might be helpful to also define it yeah. and talk about like exactly what that means again. Um, and then also just, can you go into it more intensively? Huh? Uh, uh, yeah. in, the, in the group intensives or one-on-one -on -one intensives, um, do they prefer this over weekly sessions? Like just talk yeah. a little bit more about that since there was so much interest. Here's the thing, right? Yeah. Um, in therapy, in weekly therapy, a 45 minute session, traditional model therapy, which who knows who started that model, probably insurance, who knows <laughs> yeah. if that's the best model, right? But the nature of that is every single week you sit down with a client and you have some sort of opening line. Where do you want to start? How is your week? How are you doing today? It takes them 25 minutes to get warmed up and find their place again in the work. And so then they got about, you know, 20 minutes left to actually do deep work. By the end of it, they're doorknobbing, as we say in, th in therapy, they, they say the most important thing on the way out because it took them 45 minutes to get depth. Totally. And then next week, we have to find our place all over again, right? That's the nature of therapy. Now, the good therapists will help people find depth right away and say, start the next session by saying, hey, last week, you're walking out the door and you said something pretty significant, right? Or you said this thing about your mom. Can we start there? Let's start there. And you can achieve depth again right away. That being said, it's emotionally so much for clients to unpack every single week for an hour. They're in the middle of their work day. They're, a lot of this is remote therapy. They're at the office. They're on their way home. They're doing it from their car, whatever. Um, there's an inefficiency to it, right? And having to open you know, things up again every single week, right? And find your place. Yeah. So in an intensive model, you're, you're, you're taking all that work and you're batching it together, right? It's a more efficient way of working. 
especially if you have a model or an approach for something that is a very targeted approach. EMDR, for example, we've done intensives for EMDR. So for, for trauma, right? It's, it can be gut-wrenching to come in and do EMDR every single week and then try to feel okay and go back to work and be a functioning person after that versus doing you know, a six-hour day where we do EMDR, we take breaks, we, you take a walk, you do mindfulness, whatever it is. And you're getting that depth and you're getting the, the full dose in a shorter period of time. Who wouldn't want that? Therapy's painful, right? I don't want clients to be in pain longer than they have to be. I have a coaching client, you know, a therapist in Atlanta. Her entire business is Gottman Couples Therapy Intensives. Works great for couples therapy. It would work great for social anxiety, for OCD, for um, I have a client who treats selective mutism in children. She has a, a beginning, a middle, and end to her work and her process. It's the perfect format for something like an intensive, right? So it could be a day, it could be two days, could be two weekends back to back. I don't know. Um, that's how I think about it. Um, and my good friend Sadie, who is um, asking questions here, um, is saying, how do you recommend we recruit clients for intensives? Well, um, a lot of people aren't necessarily searching for intensive. Some of them are. And if you look at Google Trends, people are searching things like EMDR intensive. So that's one way is to create a page for it, you know, to have a focused strategy with Google ads and SEO for it. I think a better way is to target your email list. And all therapists should be building their email list slowly but surely. And um, as you grow into hundreds and thousands of contacts, you launch, you, 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 know, you pitch your new products and services to your email list. That's a captive audience, right? Of people who know, like, and trust you and want to hear from you. If I have an intensive or a retreat or a course or whatever, I'm going to go to my warmest audience, which is always my email list. So some therapists think it's boring. They skip past it, whatever, like, oh, no one uses email anymore. Um, definitely not true. It's a really powerful place to, to market. It's the reason why you guys are on this webinar right now, right? Is, is that you have that no like, and trust factor with Spruce or with me or both. And um, you're a, a very warm audience to then come to this webinar. So you want to keep serving your audience. Um, that's how I would market it. Nice. I, um, I can't help but notice that we've had a few questions come in that are asking uh, specifically about how you have used Spruce to practice more yeah. efficiently. Um, in fact, one person said they're embarrassed to admit that um, they struggle with getting case notes uh, yeah. done because they just don't have the time. And like, how's what's a great way to get organized on the back end? Um, I mean, I personally also was dying to know how you got to Spruce yeah. and decided that was the right thing for you. And then ultimately how you leverage it to be more efficient. You know, it really, I think it's what, what's pretty crazy. And, and um, I don't know how many people are, you know, the, at your company now, but has grown so much because you fixed a bunch of problems for a healthcare practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I got in touch with Spruce through um, like Facebook messaging with your founder, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> David, um, years and years ago before many people knew about Spruce and we started kind of working together. We did podcast sponsorship and then I started using it for my practice. And again, I was using something like Google voice or grasshopper or whatever, again, right tool for the right job. There wasn't one. Mm -hmm. So I was just using whatever, right. And one, whatever was close enough. Um, the way that I use it now. And one feature that is really handy for our group practice is I have an intake coordinator who has Spruce on her phone, right? She's the main one facilitating those, new client contacts and those, those new inquiries, people either call or text our main number. And that goes to her phone, you know, to her, her iPhone through Spruce. <clears throat> she also uses it like a CRM to manage um, the sales process. Someone calls and, you know, they're a maybe she'll make a note directly on Spruce to say client is interested in trauma therapy with John, you know, was quoted at this rate for this time, client's going to get back to me or follow up with client, you know, in two days or whatever. So she'll do things like that. And then also if, and when she's out of town or needs help, <clears throat> our practice manager will step in and help with the phones and we'll have, you know, access to that information, access to those notes and um, can answer the calls in the case that she can't, or let's say it rings to the intake coordinator first, she's busy. And then it rings to my practice manager. She can answer as a backup. Um, so there's a lot of ways like that and I, in which I think it, it can just be really handy. And that's obviously just scratching the surface with other features that Spruce has and has rolled out over time. 
one question kind of came up about you just mentioned your intake coordinator and I think you mentioned virtual assistants yeah um and someone asked about like HIPAA compliance and BAA and um so yeah. I don't know if you want to speak on that and I can also speak to HIPAA compliance and Spruce as well I, I think that's a big one I genuinely don't know off the top of my head another phone system that's affordable for therapists especially if you're a solo practitioner or a small group um, that works has a beautiful interface which is very important to me it's just a lot of why I chose my EHR and um, is is HIPAA compliant right so most phone systems simply aren't or there's some you know kind of extra process to get grasshopper or whoever to sign a BAA so I think again right tool for the right job use it right use use the right tool yeah and, and we hear a lot that where virtual assistants it comes in handy like you just said is like you can write the internal notes mm -hmm. and that's stored securely like a lot of other systems don't even have like a note a phone system with note taking right there and so you can collaborate around the communication in a human in a hipaa compliant way which is yeah. a big difference and it never gets on your personal phone of your virtual assistant or your assistant yeah. um it's always is within Spruce, which stored securely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that we, we hear that a lot. And we actually have other blog posts about kind of virtual assistants and stuff. So if people want to check out our blog as well. Um, also, another question came up because you just said affordable. So I will just say uh, someone asked about pricing. If you go to our uh, sprucehealth.com, we have a plans page and our pricing is $24 per user, meaning per clinician or staff person to start. And then we have another plan that's upgraded if you need additional features. But generally, a lot of our therapists are using the $24 per month for unlimited texting, phone and fax. Um, and that includes live phone calls because that was another question that came up. It, it's yeah. a real phone system. Yeah, it'll ring all the way to your self, your iPhone or whoever's iPhone. I mean, that yeah. is essential, right? And if you're paying someone to be there, um, they, you know, my intake coordinator can basically take the business wherever she is, right? And she lives in a different state. Um, and, and I know that she can have that access to our kind of front desk, so to speak, wherever she is. So yeah, it's very easy to get her set up or to switch users or to switch the order of phones in which it rings, right? It rings her phone. And then if she doesn't answer the practice manager, you can do a lot of things like that. Interesting. You know, John, one thing that came in that I think is uh, fascinating, and we've touched on this before in the past, is rates. And I know that you were talking a little bit about your rates and, yeah. and how to establish them. Um, someone wrote in and said that they recently bumped up their hourly uh, yeah you know, 125 to 150, and now they're charging 175 for new clients, but maybe should have even gone higher. Um, yeah. You know, how to know what to charge and then ultimately how to develop a group practice so that yeah. you can kind of leverage the tools that we're talking about. I have a YouTube video about this, you know, how to set your fees and the way I teach it is to reverse engineer your ideal income, right? So um, once you've figured out again, want versus need, and then figured out the actual target for your annual revenue, uh, and I can do this really quick. Let's say the target is 200K, right? Or 30% less than that. You're going to add 30% for taxes, expenses, et cetera. But let's say it's 200K. And then you figure out how many weeks per year you want to work. Let's call it 48. That's taking off four weeks a year. Then all of a sudden you need to make 4166 per week. That's your next target for this income. How many clients do you want to see? I want to see 18 clients a week my fee is $231 per session. I, I like to run these numbers all the time just to see what's possible, right? And to have some purpose behind my numbers. Most therapists, they set their fees by going, what's he charging? What's she charging? I'll charge a little less or a little more. That's not a good way to differentiate in the market. It's also not a good way to design your business. Most therapists have designed their business on emotion or whim or nothing, right? Or just... FOMO, a Facebook group, you know, what they heard in a Facebook group. So I won't get on that soapbox. That's one of my many soapboxes. Um, that's one way to do it. In this person's case, you know, if, if, if Jim, I think it's Jim saying, um, I raised it to 175, it should have been 200. I'm getting very little resistance. If you're getting no resistance, your fee is too low. It's as simple as that, right? You should be getting some resistance, um, you know, some, some objections, we call them. Um, what I would say is we aim for at least a 50% conversion rate of all new client increase for a cash pay practice. Um, that's what we look for minimum, right? 
you can make a case for way higher fees, right? A higher fee indicates a higher level of expertise, right? There's a therapist here in San Francisco, a couples therapist who is well known and he charges what some would say are exorbitant fees. When people see that fees, whether it's a client or a therapist, they see, okay, whatever it is, five, $600 for a couples therapy session. Wow, that's a lot of money. He must be really freaking good, right? There's also research that clients are more invested, do better work, get more out of it, take it more seriously, do their therapy homework when they pay more. I'm not saying everyone go charge 600. It's a journey to figure out what your value is and how to own your fee, own your value in the market. Most therapists are undercharging, right? A lot of companies, you know, we live in San Francisco. Uh, a lot of tech employees have amazing benefits. They have, you know, PPO that'll reimburse 60% of my fee. So, you, you know, that 250 is not a true 250 for my clients. And if it is, don't manage your client's wallets. That's not your job as a therapist right? You don't need to figure out why it's affordable for them or not affordable or to feel bad about it. Let them manage their wallet and decide, you know, how important your, this work is and how important your help is as their therapist. Nice. Um, John, question for you. Um, of, of the Spruce features that you use, I mean, which would you say are, are probably the tools that you use most often? And uh, someone was asking too that you had mentioned, of course, that your practice offers EMDR, um, and they're wondering, do you use Spruce to facilitate that? Yeah, at the, at the moment we don't use it for video sessions, but I know it's an option, and mm -hmm. again, a good option. Um, I, I think the main ones for us are, um, I, I mean, using it as a straightforward phone system. Clients more and more like to text you know, and text the main number. And so that's something that, that we can do and don't have a problem doing, um, especially a lot of younger people really like to text and having that go directly to, you know, the intake coordinators app, that CRM feature or that being able to take notes or assign a conversation to people, I think is really handy. You know, if someone's client reaches out, you can assign that conversation to the correct person. I think that's really great. Um, yeah, so really using like the the main kind of, phone features, uh, I think are really, really quite handy for us. Excellent. We've also had a few questions come in about um, how you figure out what you can delegate and, yeah. and you can outsource and even where to find those sorts of resources. Yeah. Uh, how and, and I love your reference to like the superhero syndrome, because I mean, Jess and I, I think will be the first to admit that I think we both suffer from that. Like we're the only yeah. ones who can do our jobs the best. Right. How, um, how do you figure out what you can delegate and then really how to how to find that person to help? The first thing, again, is to write down the tasks. Right. That's how you can create your first job description. Again, for most solo practitioners, it's going to be your VA intake coordinator, practice manager person who's mm -hmm. doing everything from answering the phones. Maybe they are sending super bills for people. Maybe they are, um, uh, yeah, yeah, doing those intake calls, setting them up on your EHR, whatever it may be, might be. Um, maybe they're helping with your marketing, right? Maybe they're writing blog posts or social media or email marketing, whatever it might be. Once you get started with your first hire, you're going to find so much for them to do. It'll be unbelievable. And you can't believe you've been doing it all yourself. Um, where to find them? Now, there's two options here. Let's say you're hiring your first VA. It's a question we get a lot. There's two options. You can go through an agency, a VA agency that already helps therapists and they know therapists. They know things like Spruce and the main EHRs. Um, they know about confidentiality. They've been trained in it. Um, things like that. Now, you can go to them and you're going to pay 40 to 60 bucks an hour for a VA that they have hired, trained, and that they're supervising. The benefit is, you know, they're, they're pretty much ready to go and they're doing it for other practices. They also probably have a schedule where they're answering the phone for a bunch of other practices. Um, the, down, the, the, the other benefit is if and when they leave, they've already got your stuff, your logins, your passwords, everything, and the agency will, you know, plug in a new VA for you. So there's a lot of benefit there. Also, if, you're, if you don't have any experience managing people, this might be the way to go and pay the extra cost. Now, if you're comfortable managing people and you want to get into that, I would recommend hiring someone yourself. So going to Indeed or LinkedIn or even Craigslist and posting a job description for your first virtual assistant, um, you're going to pay a lot less, but you're also going to have to, a uh, VA is a virtual assistant. Um, thank, thank you for that question, Molly. Um, 
you're going to, you're going to pay less, but you're going to have to step into that role as a manager more and probably train them from the ground up. You'll pay them directly as a W2 or a contractor, depending on a number of factors that I you know, can't get into. Um, and again, if, and when they leave, you know, you'll have to fill that position again. So it really just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, yeah. Hope that helps. Yeah. That's great. And Jess, thank you for answering questions behind the scenes too. I did see that um, someone was asking, because I, I made the mistake of bundling a couple of questions together and uh, we may have kind of glossed over the how to address taking case notes. Now, John, I don't know if you use this, but I've talked to folks who will actually capture notes within each client profile in Spruce. And it kind of makes it a paper-free practice um, and it keeps it so well organized. Do yeah. you find that you do that? Um, which, which part exactly? Well, with the, the case notes, um, because yeah. sometimes folks don't have that time between yeah. sessions to capture everything, or they're not jotting it down, maybe mid session. Yeah. Um, and I even know that some of my doctors are taking notes on tablets as we're meeting of the, course. all paper free. Yeah. Um, is yeah. that, do you find yourself doing that? How do you address taking case notes? The, you have to find what works for you. I mean, my, my way of doing it is having a pen and paper during the session and taking notes of the main things that I need to remember for the note. Um, in a good day, I would write, I would actually create that note in between session. Now we also don't take insurance in my practice. So the note is a little more, you know, bare bones perhaps, um, you have to find what works for you. If you're more than a day or two late on your notes, you're getting into some pretty tricky territory, right? It's going to be really hard to remember seven days from now what a client said, you know, what happened in the session. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, I have an old supervisor who has an iPad and would take notes just directly on that iPad, like on a note, um, and then take that and take a screenshot and upload it to your EHR, right? There's your note. I think that's a pretty smart way to do it. You could take a picture of your notes, do it that way. Um, it, it, I think it really just depends, you know, what works for your style. Does it take you out of the moment as a therapist? Does it help you be more focused? You can use it as an intervention with clients. And, you know, if only my doctor did this, but I'm with my doctor, you know, he doesn't look at me once. He's just on the screen like this. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh, uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, this, this dude's not even listening. Right. Um, no one likes that <laughs> as a therapist, we need to be doing the opposite, be very present, very attuned to our clients. And so, you can tell your client and make them feel even more seen by saying things like, hey, that part you just said, I really want to make sure I remember this. So I'm going to write this down, right? Or I'm going to quote you on this because this sounds so important. This is about who you are or something you realized or something big happened. I want to make sure I write that down. Yeah, that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, use it as an intervention. So, it, yeah. you know, therapists struggle chronically with notes and um, probably always will. Um, but it's just part of, you know, the job that you have to find habits that'll work for you. For sure. And then, you know, this one's probably for Jess. Um, would you say the best place to document things on each client between sessions is in the internal section? What would be your, your, uh... yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's a few questions coming in about EHRs. Yeah. Um, so definitely like the, if depending on your EHR and how easy it is to take notes quickly, if you already have to document there, that would be the number one place. But internal notes in Spruce can also be another place that you can document if you don't have an EHR or if you just find it easier because you can use the iPad app or your laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also collaborate with your virtual assistant to have them upload it to your EHR. So lots of options kind of um, depending on what you find to be most efficient. Um, and yeah. John, any recommendations for EHRs? Because we got a, a few questions about that, but just briefly, I know there's a lot. Of choices. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I, mean, I would just say pick one of the big ones, right? And, and do a, do a trial of each one till you find the one you like. Um, the big ones that I will say um, are a, a simple practice therapy notes. Um, Jane is another one. It's a Canadian company. It's kind of merging into our industry, full transparency. They're sponsoring our, our show right now. So I've been talking a lot about Jane. Um, use each one, do a free trial and test drive each one, see what works for you. Which one do you find most intuitive? And if you have an admin, have your admin do it too, because they're going to be spending a lot of time in this, probably more than your clinicians are. So make sure they're comfortable with it. Um, it should be pretty intuitive pretty early on. And then once you get set up with an EHR, you know, it's uh, a lot of people don't want to change later. So it is important to really do your due diligence here. Make sure it's something. Um, 
I like, you know, software that's beautiful, functional, makes me happy to use again. A part of the reason why I like Spruce, again, everything's really well designed. Aesthetically, it looks good. It's easy for me to navigate. I don't have time for clunky apps, right? Or things that look like they're built in the 1990s. So that's just me. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, we had one a person write in to ask more about my, right, how to get to that mindfulness and um, be more intentional. And for that one, because I know we're, we're, we're running short on time, I would say, um, and as you can see the slide up in front of you now, John has graciously offered uh, to, to give anybody who is interested a free 30 minute introductory session with him um, since you joined today's webinar and you've been so invested in this conversation. Uh, you know, Samantha, in this case, I would say, take John up on that and just ask him um, specifically how you can be more mindful and more intentional. Cause I'm sure he would probably yeah. love to wax on about, about that one. Yeah, I, I would. Um, yeah. The easiest way to get that call. Um, so twice a year, we open doors for our business made human program. It's a weekly mastermind, really helping you build a business that's designed around your vision, your purpose. Um, and we open that twice a year. So go to privatepracticeworkshop.com click on business made human anywhere on the site. And then you'll go to a page where you can book that call with me. So just doing those calls for the next two weeks. And um, I definitely love to connect with you all and see if I can point you in the right direction or, or be the one to help you out, which, whichever works. And then um, as I said before, we've got tons of free content weekly on the podcast and YouTube channels. So check those out as well. That's awesome. Well, um, we'll just tackle maybe. Oh, sure. Well, let's see. May just asked if you could repeat those instructions. Uh, <laughs> you know what, May? I have one better for you. Um, I am going to be sending out a recording of this webinar and the slides. And also in about a week, um, I'm going to have this written out as a handbook that I'm going to send to all you folks. So you can actually read verbatim everything that John has shared with us today. So don't worry, you won't miss out. Um, final quick question while we still yeah. have a couple minutes. Um, do, is it possible for you to address transitioning from insurance-based practice to private pay? And I don't know if that's a succinct statement, but if you could touch on it. Um, transition from insurance to private pay. Yeah, of course. I've helped a lot of therapists do this. The, the short answer is a lot of them have almost like a cooling off period, kind of like a divorce, um, where you give your notice that you're leaving their panel and there's a 90-day period where you're still on it. Part of that is to protect the clients who need your help and their trust, you know, they're relying on you taking Blue Cross Blue Shield. You give that notice to the companies, you're getting off the panel. And then at that point, you know, your clients are going to decide, do I go somewhere else? Someone who takes my insurance, do I stay here and pay privately? And if I do, do I have any out of network benefits that could, you know, get, uh, get used here? The, what I would say with this is a reason why some therapists don't do it or they do it and they fail is because their marketing isn't where it needs to be. Insurance can be a powerful marketing piece, right? If I'm on Blue Cross Blue Shield and I'm one of the few people in San Francisco that's on it, people are going to discover me through that, you know, th through that process all the time. And you're like, wow, I have a full practice. That's great. I want to get off insurance and I assume my practice will still be full. Usually not the case. So you need to be marketing on your own, right? And in our case, what I teach is really a very Google centric strategy, Google ads, Google My Business, SEO and email marketing, but really getting a great website that speaks clearly to a defined niche, has compelling client-centered copy, and then we focus on getting lots of Google traffic from all, all three places. So, you know, I would do that. I would make sure your marketing is as done as possible and you have consistent traffic and or consistent ads. And then also financially, you know, you get the boat as close to the dock as possible, meaning build up three to six months of a financial reserve for that transition, knowing that your revenue could go down. If it goes down 30%, is that okay? Can you handle that? You know, can you and your family handle that? So if you do those things, then I think it can be a, a smooth and, um, you know, exciting transition if you do it right. Love that. Thank you. Love all of it. You have shared so much yeah. incredible information. Um, as everyone can see, these are some links to some really great resources. And I will be sharing this deck with you so that you can, don't worry about jotting these down. You're going to get this in a few minutes. Um, and, and two, take advantage of that three, uh, you know, the free 30 minute intro session with John. Um, you can do that by going to that bottom link there, the private practice workshop uh, forward slash join business made human. Um, 
Let's see. I think that may be our last slide, but I want to just quickly say a, a humongous thank you to John Clark for taking an hour out of your day today and really My walking through some incredible content. You are a wealth of information, and I know we're all really grateful. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in around uh, the legalities of of you know, being in practice. Um, and for those of you who are interested, next month, we have the top 10 legal considerations for treating patients virtually, which I think a lot of folks are doing today. Um, I won't read through all of this. It's a mouthful. But we do have Catherine Nickel, a leading healthcare regulatory attorney, joining us. Um, and she's going to talk about everything from state statutes around telehealth to establishing the, you know, the, the, the relationship with your clients, uh, documentation of informed consent, and even limitations that can lead to malpractice. So if this sounds like something that's interesting to you, I will also include a link to the registration in the email that I'll be sending out shortly. And you will just be all set for... Uh, everything you need to know to run an effective practice. So let's see, I, I think we captured everything. We got, we got some thanks coming in. Again, thank you, John. Thank you, Jessica. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you can always reach out to us and keep your eyes peeled for the email that will be coming shortly. Yeah, just feel free to respond to that email or you can email sales at sprucehealth.com if you're interested in joining Spruce and then support at sprucehealth.com. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Have a Thank trip. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.